Okay, what you're going to see is just a bag of Russian propaganda. Well, this is obviously the reaction that I am expecting from the usual professional trolls. But if you're interested in understanding why Russia is developing a brand new fighter jet while in the middle of a war and what impact it could have, then get comfortable and keep watching. And stay till the end if you want to understand why I believe this project is going to turn out even more important than the Su-57 for the Russian aerospace. Ah, and we are obviously talking about the Su-75 Checkmate. Disclaimer. We know that some of the pictures we used show a potentially outdated configuration. Thank you, Otis. What Otis means is that the Su-75 is not flying yet, even though the first flight should be not too far away, so we don't know the exact configuration of the machine. However, we do have enough information to start analyzing the aircraft beyond the mere artistic impressions. There is indeed official documentation that explains what this strange thing on the tail is, or why the tips of the wings are oddly familiar, or why the intake looks like this, and plenty of other quite curious solutions. But as usual, let's start from the beginning. I am sure many will remember the brilliant, absolutely brilliant, spectacular presentation of the first Su-75 ground prototype at MAX in July 2021. However, this wasn't the first time the world unknowingly heard about the Su-75. In fact, in February 2017 at the IDEX Expo in Abu Dhabi, Russia and the United Arab Emirates announced a joint initiative to produce a stealth fighter tailored for the UAE requirements. And obviously the UAE was a financial partner rather than a co-developer. At the time, the predominant consensus was that a steel-thized variant of the Su-35 or the MiG-35 could be proposed, mostly along the lines of the never-produced Silent Eagle concept. But this was not going to be the case. The Suhoi Bureau decided to develop a completely new aircraft. The UAE in the last decade has taken a political stance oriented at managing post-American and multipolar world. This cooperation with Russia could be seen as part of this policy. There was some disappointment in Western diplomacies, but the UAE went ahead with the agreement. The development was relatively quick for an aircraft basically designed from scratch. The Suhoi Bureau used digital engineering to arrive to a non-flying prototype by July 2021. In fact, contrary to what many sources said, what was unveiled in July 2021 wasn't a mock-up. It was a non-flying prototype, which was assembled to assess the general design and allow for the setup of the production machines. When the invasion of Ukraine started in February 2022, many considered the Su-75, together with other Russian aerospace projects, basically a dead end. But this was not the case. The Su-75 proceeded, and at the beginning of November 2023, the aircraft drawings were officially delivered to the factory to produce four prototypes. So one thing that the Russians don't do is concurrency, which is... Quite a wise choice, if you ask me. So for now, we only have orders for four prototypes. Production must wait. When the prototype was presented, it was also announced that a buyer was already on the list, and that was actually the UAE. The manufacturer, though, UAC, has made clear that the aircraft is a private initiative kick-started by the UAE participation and continued as a private venture and aimed for export markets. The first flight is expected in 2024, and the first deliveries in 2027. But deliveries to whom? So the proposition behind the Su-75 is relatively simple. It is designed to be a light-medium fifth-generation fighter with low acquisition and maintenance cost, very simple to maintain, great versatility, and the capability to operate in very austere conditions. 
it is explicitly seen as an alternative to the F-35 for those countries that don't have access to the American aircraft. UAC marketing refers to countries like the UAE, Vietnam, Argentina, Algeria and so on, but the situation at the time of this video, the end of 2023, has somewhat changed. In fact, recently the UAE seems to have reduced its footprint in the project, albeit UAE financial institutions are still involved in co-production and co-financing of specific systems. Then Argentina has been offered the used Danish F-16s at a bargain price. Algeria seems to be in the process of ordering the Su-57, so it's unlikely that the Su-75 will be of interest, at least in the short medium term. However, there is a letter of intent from Nigeria and some interest has been shown by Iran, probably is the ideal customer for such an aircraft. Some contacts have happened with India, but the country is well on its way to self-sufficiency, so it's quite an unlikely customer. What is sorely missing, though, is the order of records from the Russian Air Force. The VKS has a policy to acquire only dual-engine aircraft, and the Su-75 is a single engine. Furthermore, the VKS today has definitely more pricing issues. But there is a big but about the VKS attitude toward the Su-75, and we will discuss that at the end. Anyway, why this aircraft should be interesting for this type of customers beyond, let's say, the obvious political reasons? All these countries, with the exception of Iran and India, tend to have a small industrial base and limited know-how in the aerospace sector, and yet they may be involved in confrontations with opponents that can deploy relatively modern assets. These countries require a platform that could successfully confront these assets and yet be sustainable for their resources. And the mind that it is not only the acquisition price that matters, but also the cost for flight hour, the cost of the ordnance, and the ground support that is required to operate the aircraft in terms of both infrastructure and personnel. The Russians designed the aircraft to tick all these boxes, and it is no surprise because these are traditional Russian strong points. But the Su-75 is going a bit further in this direction. The aircraft features a system called Matryoshka, uh, like the traditional dolls, which is more or less the equivalent of the F-35 Alice. The aircraft can communicate with a base station and warn the operators of the interventions that are required on the aircraft itself. The system will also talk with UAC to manage the spare supply and other more complex activities. This will be combined with a full service from UAC that allows the customer to minimize the domestic impact of the aircraft, delegating all the depot-level maintenance and above to the Russians, even though the Russians don't call it depot maintenance. This is a typical Russian approach, sir. In the nuclear industry, the Russian Rosatomit is very successful. True. Thank you, Otis. That's a good example. There are also unconfirmed news of the aircraft featuring a quick wing disassembly feature, such that the aircraft could fit inside the transport aircraft, which could be useful to move it quickly to and from the factories. However, how do the Russians expect to achieve these good financial performances? Well, a lot depends on how the aircraft is made. The Su-75 Checkmate is a single-engine, light-medium-weight fighter. It features low observability shape, canted vertical images, and a highly tapered wing. The wing platform is delta and the leading edge is quite thin, so it should actually act as a proper delta. And since the aircraft is not flying yet, we only have the design specifications. Otis, uh, please. The aircraft is also called LTS or Light Tactical Aircraft in English. The unconfirmed NATO moniker is Screamer, which is odd because it doesn't start with F like all other fighters. The aircraft will be available in three variants, single-seater, dual-seater and unmanned, which I believe is a world first, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below. 
The possibility of having a naval variant is not excluded. The aerodynamics and the wings seem suitable, but it is not in the cards for now. The single and the dual seaters will also be optionally manned, a feature that has been already demonstrated by the Su-57. Operationally is probably not very useful, but I suppose it is great to bring home an unconscious pilot or to potentially continue a mission with an unconscious pilot on board. The construction is mixed using titanium, aluminum and carbon fiber composites. So structurally speaking, it is relatively traditional and this should concur in keeping the cost low and the stiffness high, even though the overall weight and rigidity won't be at the very top of the modern constructions. The Russian composites industry has progressed a lot in the last few decades, but the consensus is that it is still somewhat lacking if compared with Western products. On the contrary, Russia has plenty of titanium and aluminum available at a low cost and a huge expertise in using titanium. The geometric stealth is expected to be integrated by RAM coating. It is not clear if this time the composite cladding itself will have embedded RAM properties. The Su-75 features several interesting construction details. Before going on, I point out that we try referring to the configuration that emerged from some patents filed by the designers, which is a bit different from the one presented at Max originally in 2021. So here we are using one of the pictures that are found in the patents. As you can see, the side of the aircraft is inclined as per classic geometric stealth, and even the tail is inclined more or less with the same angle. Again, good geometric stealth, very classic, I would say. The aircraft also has this strange shape in here, but there are no acute angles and crucially no 90 degrees angles. So the radiation is not reflected toward the emitter. In fact, the radar radiation coming from the side, for example, from this direction, will be reflected somewhat in this direction. Here on the front, you can see the walls of the air intake and they have the same inclination. So this is a case of not plan form, but profile alignment. So to concentrate all the radar reflection, all the possible radar reflection toward one single direction. From the side view, we see that the aircraft is not area ruled because, well, that's normal for modern aircraft. They are no longer area ruled because speed doesn't matter too much. And it is quite interesting to see that the tail is entirely mobile. This solution is not new. We have seen it on the Su-57 before. Okay, this is a picture of the aircraft that was presented at max in 2021 you can see that the bottom of the aircraft is flat but the aircraft as such is not a lifting body there is a well-defined fuselage and there is a well-defined wing okay in this picture you see on the left the original platform presented in 2021 and on the right the more recent platform that has been shown in in the patents. As you can see on the left, we have uh, some more attention for uh, the platform alignment. This part of the wing has been added and it is mobile. There is a mobile surface there, but this part here is actually platformed aligned with the leading edge, also with the trailing edge of this appendix. We also see that this line is aligned with this line, uh, the leading edge extension slash the stealth ridge on the side of the fuselage. The only part that remains not aligned is the external part of the wing and the wing tip, which has its own specific shape. And also notice how here on the back, the nozzle is also hidden by the tail of the aircraft uh, in a way not as similar as the F-22 or the F-35. The checkmate wing, as you can see here, seems to be quite thin. So I suspect it's going to work as a proper delta. So it's going to work producing non-linear lift in most of the flight regime. A bit 
unusual in modern times, but definitely is not impossible. And there are also some, let's say, enthusiast simulations uh, of the aerodynamic flow around the aircraft that show how this ridge, which is here mostly for stealth reason, is also also producing uh, some vortices, system of vortices detaching from here, uh, which is producing non-linear lift. So they are sort of uh, having the role of leading edge extensions. And the fact that the wing is relatively thin is also confirmed by the fact that under the wing in these positions you actually have the fairings that cover the actuators, the hydraulic actuators for the aerodynamic surfaces. There is a drawing, again this is an enthusiast drawing, that actually show the housing uh, of these components. This is telling us that the Su-35 still has some very classic hydraulic actuators. If you notice, the F-35 doesn't have these protuberances because Lockheed Martin develops some very small electric actuators that are either inside the thickness of the wing or at the extremity at fuselage level. Why do you want to remove these? Because in terms of stealth, they're not ideal. They're not terrible either, but of course is one little bit of extra RCS that it would be better if avoided. The Su-75 features a DSI intake that is an intake where at its entrance has this sort of strange bump uh, whose effect is to push away and outside from the intake the boundary layer, the slow boundary layer of the aircraft and it has performances that are optimal around Mach 0.8 to Mach 1.2, which is more or less the critical range of speed that in today's fighters is used operationally. I mean, at least, for example, for air combat or uh, for high-speed, low-level penetrations. Uh, this type of intake has the big advantage of not having moving parts being very simple, so it is uh, actually a good choice for the aircraft. It is the same type of intake that you see on the F-35, that you see on the J-20. And uh, no, please notice that the decision to place the intake quite close to the aircraft nose means that the boundary layer here is not particularly well developed. The intake doesn't have to push too much stuff away. It seems to be a really good compromise my solution and uh, a modern one. So the aircraft tail is probably the section of the aircraft that has changed the most in these two years since when the first prototype was shown at the beginning was a pure V tail then the V was narrowed at the angle of the V was narrowed and now the latest incarnation is the one that we see in this model that is, we see these two appendices, which also host these two nacelles on top of them. Now in this model is not seen clearly, but the tail end of the section should be movable. There are pictures in the patents that show that part of the aircraft moving. I've heard that term pelican tail in some sources but I wouldn't call like that but if this is the case again this is an interesting aerodynamic innovation. From this model we also notice that the vertical planes are completely movable this is a solution it was also adopted on the Su-57 and it should give a good authority. So as we have already seen the construction is a mix of titanium, aluminium and carbon fiber composites but the carbon fiber is used only for the skin of the aircraft not for the structure it is possible that the tail like on the Su-57 is going to be fully composite but we don't know that for sure what we know is that the bulkheads in this section of the aircraft are made of titanium and this is also an area of the aircraft where the fuel tank is 
going to be located, as you can see for this here, there is uh, the bulkhead where the engine thrust is actually applied and the main gear is not too far off, so this is the central point of the aircraft where the top structural stiffness and top structural resilience has to be present. If I understand correctly, this part is titanium. Here at the front is aluminium. Here on the tail, the structure will still be aluminium, but the skin will be a composite. So from this position, beyond the flapping tail, here and here, you actually notice that, if I delete all this stuff, the tail is in a very, very good position to hide the nozzle from the the side and this is something which is characteristic of the current american designs when for stealth reason to hide the infrared the plume the hot plume of exhaust gases the tail of the aircraft extends beyond the nozzle hiding uh, partially hiding it from the side on from certain angles this is um, again a good practice and a clever way of uh, hiding uh, a part of the air aircraft that is prone to identification. The tail of the aircraft once again is a bit particular. This is a section of the tail of the aircraft as appears in one of the patents and as you see here there is a sort of a hatch that is opening in this way and the purpose of the hatch is to be able to lower the engine for a replacement. Now this is a bit strange to patent because various other aircraft have sort of same arrangement of, um, of the panels uh, at the bottom of the fuselage coming off uh, being hinged on one side but if I understand correctly, the idea in this case is just to open the hatch, disconnect the engine, drop the engine, place another engine, done. This is consistent with the philosophy of having a very, very easy maintenance. Here we see another view of the hatch open and the engine will go up, uh, down and up in here. And here we see a fan-made scheme of the internals of the aircraft. I think this is interesting and it's well made because here we have the main bulkhead, the one where the engine actually applies the thrust. And as you see, the main undercarriage is positioned in the same place. The wings are yellow because here they're making the, the hypothesis that they are of composite material. Okay, and speaking of the tail, both sides have these nacelles at the base of the vertical empennage. Uh, what's in there? From the patents, we know that on one side that there is the auxiliary power unit and the other side contains uh, some electronic systems. Obviously, they also host actuators for uh, all the tail surfaces, both the vertical vertical surfaces and the flapping tails. The side bays are quite particular because on these surfaces you can place different interfacing accessories that are suitable for different weapons. For example, different weapons with different weight may require different ejectors, so there may be different types of ejector that may be installed within the base to use different weapons. The, the front bays are rather large, so probably a number of different weapons can be fit in there. And one thing that can be fit is a cannon. That is here, this one should actually be the representation of a cannon fitted in one of the side bays. I am really curious to see this because, I mean, there's not much room for the ammo, so it would be interesting to see what the aircraft uh, solution will be. So regarding to the front base, the aircraft seems to be quite versatile. As we have seen, the aircraft has several elements in common with the Su-57. This is not only reasonable since they are both so high designs, but it also contributes to lower the cost for both projects. And now let me get a coffee and then we speak about propulsion. 
啊。The decision to create a single-engine aircraft is strictly linked to the decision of containing costs. If we do not include the combat systems, which alone could be a large portion of the aircraft cost, there is quite a high correlation between the aircraft weight and the aircraft cost. So a small aircraft with a single engine are functional to this purpose. However, understanding exactly which engine is going to be, it is the usual mess. So, the production engine is expected to be this Delia 30, the same engine developed for the Su-57. However, the development of this Delia 30 is a never-ending story. It always seems to be ready, it flies with the prototypes, but it is never moved into production. In some cases, it is described as a variable cycle engine with three flows, but there are drawings that show just two flows. At this stage, I don't know what to think, because the performance improvement Saturn the engine manufacturer is looking for seems hard to achieve without a variable cycle engine. And when it finally seemed to be ready for serial production, Saturn announced the further development of a B-dimensional thrust vectoring nozzle in place of the old three-dimensional that we have seen on the prototypes. This was really unexpected and pictures of the Su-75 with a flat nozzle emerged in the marketing material. The engine is sometimes called Saturn AL-51F or F1, as if it was an evolved variant of the AL-41 used in the flanker family, but the claim is that at least 80% of the engine parts are different, which would mean that it is a different engine with, with maybe a technology heritage. On top of this, there are declarations from officials at trade shows that the Su-75 will feature, indeed, an AL-41F1 with a 360-degree capable thrust vectoring nozzle. But if you look at the design of the tail, the cut seems indeed such to not allow for the nozzle movement in the horizontal plane. So it's a mess, and I honestly think that they're doing this on purpose. What I can imagine is that the Su-75 will find itself in a similar situation as the Su-57, with the initial aircraft built with a variant of the old engine, and the newest Delia 30 being introduced at a later stage. If anyone has better ideas, backed by credible sources, I am happy to listen in the comments below. Anyway, the difference in performance between the two engines may not be relevant. The declared ferry range is quite long, considered that the Russians usually quote the range without drop tanks. In terms of thrust, the AL-41F1 would produce 86 kN dry and 137 kN with the afterburner. This Delia 30 or AL-51 would produce 108 kN dry and 167 kN with afterburner. We don't know the design weights of the aircraft, but there has been a claim of a 1 to 1 thrust to weight ratio with no other details. If this is referring to the AL-41F1 with afterburner, a weight of about 14 tons with a half of the fuel and a payload on the light side, for example an air-to-air -air one, it is broadly realistic for an aircraft of this size. If this is true, then with this Delia 30 it should be capable of super cruise and the thrust to weight ratio in the same conditions would be around 1.2 to 1, which is very respectable. So I believe that the kinematic performance of this aircraft should be quite impressive, all considered, for a single engine aircraft. However, as we all know, the consensus is that the importance of our combat maneuver is diminishing and the technology on board of the air vehicle has an ever-growing importance. So, independently from the kinematic performance, what are the system plans to be on board of the Su-75? As we said, this aircraft is designed to be a low-cost option targeted for the export market. One way to keep the costs low is reusing the systems developed 
for the Su57. However, the Su75 has been designed with a modular system architecture, whose details are not public, to integrate systems of various provenance. In Ukraine, we have seen that it is not impossible to adapt ex-Soviet and Russian aircraft to Western weapons. The Su75 will be ready for such integrations. In fact, the delay between the ground test prototype presentation and the beginning of the production of the actual prototypes seems to be due, in part, to the process of migrating the Su-57 systems on the new architecture. We have already seen that the commonality with the Su-57 should include the L-band arrays and whatever antennas are under the wingtip. The main radar under the Radum should be a slightly smaller derivative of the N036-101 array, all controlled by the Mires SH-121 radar suite. On the Su-75 though, there are no side-looking arrays, uh, nor the array in the tail. The elements that should have been passed down to the Su-75 with no particular modifications are likely the central computers and the L402 ECM suite. For everything else, the aircraft configuration is basically customer dependent. In fact, in the artist's impression and the available drawings, there is no trace of the impressive series of sensors distributed around the aircraft that characterize the Su-57, but for the infrared search and track ball in the classic position under the cockpit. However, what is likely going to be new in the case of the Su-75 is the EOTS under the fuselage in pure F-35 and J-20 style. I imagine it is a derivation from the 101 KSN T-Pod designed for the Su-57. However, the EOTS is not part of the base configuration of the aircraft. So buying a Su-75 would probably look like specking a MacBook. There are no pictures of the Su-75 cockpit, but eyewitnesses have reported that it is almost exactly the same as the second generation of Su-57's prototypes. So it seems that the Su-75 may have everything the Su-57 has, but please keep in mind that the electrical power available on board is surely less than that of the Su-57 because there is just one engine, so it is likely going to have fewer elements. Well, so overall, is not a bad deal at all. If foreign system and weapons could be integrated with relative ease, it is even a better deal. So the question is, what weaponry is actually going to be integrated by default? The checkmate has one ventral weapon bay, two side bays, and two or three hard points under each wing. The maximum design payload is declared to be 7,400 kilos. In air-to-air -air mission, the aircraft can carry five medium-range missiles, three in the ventral bay, two in the side bays, without losing stealth. It should be capable of carrying four or six more under the wing hardpoints. The Su-75 is reported to integrate the various variants of the R-77 and R-7374 family. The R-37 seems to be too large and heavy for the aircraft, and it is not mentioned in the sources. For the air-to-ground and anti-ship missions, the aircraft is shown with a large panoply of almost all the current Russian weapons. So the KH-31 is a supersonic anti-ship and anti-radiation missile. It is supported, including the long variants AD and PD, probably mounted on the external pylons. KH-35 is subsonic anti-ship missile under several aspects equivalent to the American Harpoon. Uh, this can fit in the ventral bay, so it can be used for stealth operations. The KH-38 is a supersonic air-to-surface short-range weapon. It features different variants with different homing systems capable of engaging both fixed and moving targets. It is often compared to Maverick and Brimstone, but it actually has no equivalence in the Western world. Derived from the KH-38 is the KH-36 Grom family, a very interesting concept where boosters, guidance systems, and warheads may be combined to generate medium-range missiles or guided bombs. Uh, the Su-75 prototype shown at max in 2021 was actually housing a Grom in the ventral bay. And the list doesn't stop here. In fact, it seems that the aircraft will be integrated with older weapons like the KH-58 and the KH-59 missiles and the usual plethora of unguided munitions. Obviously, being capable of carrying the weapons is just the easy part. The difficult part is providing the targeting data and use them at the best of their possibility. We have already discussed the sensors, but obviously this is just part of the equation. If the Su-75 inherits the Su-57's 
subsystems, it will likely inherit the data links and the fusion engine that allows for a unified vision of the air battle, not too dissimilar in concept from that of the F-35. What is still unknown is the extent, if any, of the capability of generating totally passive firing solutions, like the F-35 does, on its own or in combination with other aircraft in a two-ship or four-ship flight, which is probably the key capability of the American aircraft. That's a pretty important point that we don't know anything about. Well, We'll see. But in the meanwhile, while the aircraft is being developed, the perspectives for the future are still uncertain. Who will receive the aircraft? Well, let's make an experiment. So let's make this conceptual experiment. Let's imagine that the war in Ukraine is over. Some form of acceptable compromise has been found, the VKS can go back to its peacetime posture, and now the problems start. Yes, because the Russian Air Force has now become a veteran force with massive experience, but on the flip side, the aircraft are worn and the losses have been heavy. On the western side of the fence, the number of fifth generation aircraft is increasing, so what direction should the VKS go? It will probably be in need of modernizing, but how? Well, surely acquiring more Su-30s, 34 and 35 is not a great solution for as much as these can be modernized and the flanker basic design seems to be capable of absorbing literally anything. Well, these are now old aircraft that belong to a past era. While the Russian economy was on war footing, one thing was difficult to scale and it was the production of aircraft. So maybe after the war with the Su-57 there and ready, the resources may be focused on it and it is likely that they will be. A possible alternative could be the PAC-DP, but yeah, we still don't know what it is, but we are more or less sure that it's going to be a relatively large platform. So both the Su-57 and eventually the PAC-DP are going to be quite expensive. Drones like the S-70 may fill the gap, but yeah, the problem is still there. In the meanwhile, the Su-75 has been developed, it is there ready or almost ready. What would you do if you were in charge of rebuilding the VKS? Okay, it has a single engine and you don't like it, but the aircraft has commonalities with the Su-57 and integration in this new world is paramount. The combat radius is shorter than you wanted, but what is the alternative? It is also a cheap aircraft, which is exactly what you need at this stage, because you also need to build some numbers. So I believe that by the time the aircraft is ready, there will be a Russian order and the aircraft will become the low component of a classic high-low mix. And there is a good chance that it will go on to become a staple of the VKS. In fact, provided the Ukrainian war ends soon, let's hope, a mid-30s VKS could be based on a Su-57, Su-75 mix for the front line, some pack DPs as interceptors, and a mix of the remaining Su-30, 34, 35. Only time will tell. So, thank you very much for getting this far into the video, I hope you have enjoyed it, and if you did, please do the usual YouTube stuff, like, subscribe, hit the bell, and choose to receive the notifications. I would really appreciate if you could consider supporting the channel on Patreon by being a member or by one-off donation. Patrons and members have access to the sources that I use for the videos and some other material that I prepare that I make available. An enormous thank you to all those who are already supporting the channel. You are incredible. You're such a big part of this operation. So, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.